Welcome to CFI's Highly Applied and Practical Financial Analysis Fundamentals. Financial analysis is really critical to understanding a company's past performance as well as its future prospects. The insight you can gain from financial analysis can really help businesses improve their profitability, their cash flows, and really their enterprise value. In this course, we'll cover a wide range of concepts. We'll look at how to undertake a comprehensive financial analysis using a wide range of different types of ratios. For example, we'll look at ratios to analyze the income statement and profitability. We'll then look at ratios to analyze operating assets and asset utilization. We'll also look at ratios that help us better understand a business's capital structure. The real intent of this analysis is to make recommendations on how a business can improve its operations, its capital structure, and even how it utilizes its assets. We'll then explore the importance of trend analysis and benchmarking performance against both a peer group and the industry at large, as well as the importance of using data visualization tools to make your analysis really come to life. And finally, we'll look at the DuPont Pyramid of Ratios, which looks at how we can combine various ratios together to get a more comprehensive view of a business. Now, in this course, you're gonna watch video lectures followed by interactive exercises, as well as comprehensive financial analysis case studies, where we together are gonna to calculate ratios for three different retailers in the same industry, and then benchmark them against each other. We'll also include assessments along the way so you can test your knowledge. Let's start by outlining a best practice approach to undertaking financial analysis. There are four essential steps that can help you gain valuable insight into a business's financial health and performance. The first step is to gather multiple years of historic financial statements. These statements typically include the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. By examining data from multiple years, you can observe patterns and trends, providing a more comprehensive view of a company's financial performance. Now, once you've collected the financial statements, it's time to calculate financial ratios. Now, financial ratios are powerful tools that allow you to assess a company's performance and compare it to the industry. Some commonly used ratios include liquidity ratios, profitability ratios, and solvency ratios. By calculating these ratios, you can gain insights into the company's liquidity, profitability, efficiency, and overall financial stability. With the calculated financial ratios in hand, it's then crucial to interpret them effectively. You want to look for trends and patterns that emerge from the ratios and try to uncover the stories behind the numbers. For example, a declining profitability ratio may indicate inefficiencies or increased competition, while a constant growth in liquidity ratio may suggest a strong cash position. By delving deeper into these ratios, you can better understand the company's financial strengths and weaknesses. Finally, to gain a broader perspective on a company's performance, it's important to benchmark the calculated ratios against an appropriate peer group or industry. This comparison allows you to evaluate how the company fares in relation to its competitors or the industry as a whole. By benchmarking, you can identify areas where the company excels or falls behind, helping you pinpoint opportunities for improvement. Remember, financial analysis is also an ongoing process that requires continuous monitoring and adjustment. By following these four steps, getting historic financial statements, calculating financial ratios, interpreting the ratios, and then benchmarking against peers, you'll be equipped to make informed decisions and uncover valuable insights into a business's financial health. Before jumping into the financial ratios themselves, I want to share with you five really important tips that can enhance the quality and the accuracy of your financial analysis. First, when conducting financial analysis, I really recommend that you gather a minimum of five years of historic financial performance. This time frame allows you to observe longer term trends and better assess the company's stability and consistency over time. 
A longer history of financial data provides a much more comprehensive understanding of a business's performance. And it also makes it much easier to identify patterns and make informed decisions. Next, to ensure accuracy and maintain transparency in your financial analysis, it's crucial to make your calculations in Excel or a similar spreadsheet software. By organizing your calculations in a very systematic manner, you can then easily trace the numbers back to the financial statements and ensure the accuracy of your ratio calculations. Transparent, visible calculations also enable you to share your analysis with others and facilitate more robust review processes. Identifying an appropriate peer group is also a key step in benchmarking your financial analysis. However, it's important to note that finding two companies that are perfectly similar is going to be really challenging. Instead, try to aim to select companies that operate in the same industry or share similar business models. While the peer group might not be a perfect match, it can still provide valuable insights into how the company performs relative to its competitors. When working with financial ratios, it's also advisable to keep adjustments to a minimum. Adjusting ratios introduces additional complexity and increases the likelihood of errors creeping into your analysis. If adjustments are necessary, document them clearly and make sure to review and validate them regularly. Minimizing adjustments allows for a more accurate assessment of a company's financial performance relative to others. Finally, in academic settings, when calculating financial ratios that involve balance sheet items, it's common practice to see balance sheet averages. For example, the average of the current year, which is called the closing balance, and the prior year, which is called the opening balance. However, in practice, virtually all analysts use current year closing balances rather than average balances. Before jumping into the financial ratios themselves, I want to share with you five really important tips that can enhance the quality and the accuracy of your financial analysis. When conducting financial analysis, it is recommended to gather a minimum of five years of historic financial performance. This time frame allows you to observe long-term trends and assess the company's stability and consistency over time. A longer history of financial data provides a more comprehensive understanding of the business's performance, making it much easier to identify patterns and then make informed decisions. To ensure accuracy and maintain transparency in your financial analysis, it's also crucial to make your calculations in Excel or a similar spreadsheet software. By organizing your calculations in a systematic manner, you can easily trace the numbers back to the financial statements, ensuring the accuracy of your ratios. Transparent calculations also enable you to share your analysis with others and facilitate collaboration or review processes. Identifying an appropriate peer group is a really key step in benchmarking your financial analysis. However, it's important to note that finding two companies that are perfectly similar is often really challenging. Instead, aim to select companies that operate in the same industry or share similar business models. While the peer group might not be a perfect match, it can still provide valuable insights into how the company performs relative to its competitors. When working with financial ratios, it is also advisable to keep adjustments to a minimum. Adjusting ratios introduces additional complexity and increases the likelihood of errors creeping into your analysis. If adjustments are necessary, document them clearly and make sure to review and validate them regularly. Minimizing adjustments allows for a more accurate assessment of the company's financial performance. When comparing financial ratios, it is common practice to use averages for academic purposes. However, in my experience in real world scenarios, almost all analysts and professionals rely on opening balances. Opening balances provide a starting point for the analysis and offer a clearer picture of the company's financial performance at the beginning of the period under review. 
using opening balances ensures consistency and facilitates meaningful comparisons over time. We are going to break our ratios into two large categories and four subcategories. First, we have performance ratios. Performance ratios speak to how a company is doing, what returns and profitability is it delivering to stakeholders, and how efficiently it's making use of its assets. Financial leverage ratios, in contrast, look at both solvency and liquidity. Solvency ratios focus on a company's long-term financial health and its ability to meet long-term obligations, while liquidity ratios assess the company's short-term cash position and its ability to handle immediate financial needs and obligations. Both solvency and liquidity are important considerations when evaluating a company's financial well-being. We're going to start our financial analysis journey by focusing on return and profitability ratios. Before diving into our return and profitability ratios, let's do a quick recap of the three financial statements. First is the income statement, also referred to as the statement of profit and loss, or P&L, which shows what a business has earned as revenues, what it's paid out in expenses, and the resultant profit or loss for a given period. The balance sheet, also known as the statement of financial position, shows what a business owns, its assets, what it owes, its liabilities, and what it's worth its equity at a particular point in time. The statement of cash flows shows how a business has generated or used cash for operating, investing, or financing activities. We're starting with return ratios, and for return ratios, we're going to need both the income statement and the balance sheet, while for the profitability ratios that we'll do next, we only are going to need the income statement. So let's get started. Return ratios are essential in evaluating investment returns. Two widely used ratios are return on assets, sometimes referred to simply as ROA, and return on equity, sometimes referred to as simply ROE. Now, for each of these ratios, we compare the bottom line profit from the income statement. That's known as net income, net earnings, or net profit. Yes, they're all synonyms for the same thing. And we compare that to either total assets and the return on assets ratio, or to total shareholders' equity in the return on equity ratio. Another important ratio, though less common, is return on invested capital, or ROIC. With ROIC, we aim to assess the returns not only to equity investors, but to all capital providers, including debt holders. In this case, we calculate a profit figure called net operating profit after tax, commonly referred to as simply NOPAT. Now, NOPAT is derived by taking EBIT, or earnings before interest and tax, which is also sometimes referred to as operating profit, from the income statement and then multiplying it by one minus the tax rate. Now, let's discuss a fundamental principle that should always be at the forefront of your mind when conducting financial analysis, and that is comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. This principle emphasizes the importance of ensuring that the metrics being compared are of the same nature and relevance. So let's revisit the return on equity ratio. Since the profit that belongs to shareholders is net income, we divide shareholder profit or net income by equity to calculate return on equity. This ratio specifically focuses on the returns generated for equity investors. Now let's return to ROIC. Here we need to incorporate a profit metric that encompasses both shareholders and debt holders. Hence, we calculate a profit figure that excludes interest expenses representing the returns to debt holders.